Everyone among you, everyone who's listening to me now, has dirty money. How come? You didn't know about that? Your government knows about that. But your government is not interested you to be aware of that. Your government is interested to make profit out of selling secrecy. I'm talking about corporate secrecy. When kleptocrats, terrorists, and organized criminal groups are able to hide themselves behind complex corporate structures. And what can be discovered behind this corporate vial? And what can happen after you reveal this vial? I will tell you now. My story starts a year and a few months ago, where there was Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine. Uh, probably some of you heard about these events when the million of people protested against corrupt kleptocratic regime. And at some point, that protest became very dangerous. People on the streets could be kidnapped, could be bitten, could be tortured, sometimes killed. At that night, uh, me and a few of my other colleagues from the Anti-Corruption Action Center, a small NGO, we were staying at our office in downtown Kyiv, and we were doing some analytical work. It was our way of protest. And by doing this work, we were revealing corporate secrecy. And we were uh, showing what stays behind uh, the corporate secrecy. Basically, everyone in Ukraine who was protesting understood that the regime, the very kleptocratic regime and President Yanukovych, uh, they were trying to protect their enormous wealth and power. Uh, enormous wealth which they generated by robbing our country through corruption, through money laundering and through other very bad schemes. Uh, it was obvious for everyone in Ukraine, but it was not obvious for Western societies, Western democratic societies like the EU and US, which actually accepted this process of grand corruption and grand robbery. And they accepted it through corporate secrecy. What we were doing could look like that. We were revealing various schemes. This is example how a president, a prime minister and head of the Security and Defense Council of the country, 45 million country, are using the services of secrecy of one Western lawyer and hiding their wealth behind these uh, complex structures. Or uh, the scheme could look uh, like that uh, when um, a senior politician uh, is taking a 450 million euro loan from the state bank and uh, pretends it is a foreign investor investing into the solar energy of your country. So, and uh, a senior politician is structuring the company uh, in such a complex scheme so that you would never find out who is that physical person uh, behind these companies uh, really controlling all the deals. So, why we were doing that? Why we were caring about that? Uh, I'm a lawyer and I know that. It is a law which requires Western financial institutions, professional, uh, professionals like lawyers and notaries, when they are dealing with clients, which are companies, to find out who is identity, who is a physical person staying really behind this company, and who really controls this company. If this physical person uh, is a politician, a senior foreign politician, or even a friend or a son or a daughter of a politician, their financial institutions have to find out the origin of funds coming into the accounts in the Western Bank. And if there is suspicion only about this uh, origin of these funds, they have to block accounts and they have to report law enforcement and financial intelligence unit about this suspicion. And it could start, it could trigger money laundering investigation outside of the country from which, which proceeds of crime are coming. So for us at that very moment, it was the only hope, 
the only solution to trigger investigation against that very kleptocratic regime, against those guys who were controlling the country and who were enjoying full impunity. They were untouchable. And it made them to kill people. And it made them to rob the entire state. And we were trying to send them the message that, listen, guys, you can be touchable. There is a possibility to trigger investigation and to freeze your money and your assets, which you are keeping outside of the country. So it was our purpose. Um, at one of the nights which we were uh, doing our analytical work, revealing all that secrecy, uh, putting it in, on, online in English, uh, and uh, we were delivering that to uh, Western decision makers and to law enforcement. So at one of the nights, we realized that we have to leave the country. Uh, we were uh, noticed by the special police units uh, right across the window of our office. So in, in about 45 minutes, me and a few other my colleagues had to pack my stuff uh, and to uh, leave Ukraine to be able to continue that work, that kind of protest. We never knew when we will come back and whether we will come back, but we knew that we will visit every single Western country, at least in Europe, which accepts dirty Ukrainian money. The first country we went was Austria. Uh, we were doing some direct actions there. We uh, used all these schemes uh, to show to local journalists uh, we went to, to local media to explain to the people, listen, yes, the revolution is there, people are dying there, but money are here, dirty money are here. Dirty money of those who are killing people there are being penetrating the financial system here, and you might have this dirty money in your pocket, even not knowing about that. Actually, uh, we returned back uh, to Ukraine in a month when uh, regime was overturned, but it happened um, after mass murders on, on, on Central Square of Ukraine, and it happened after, after these mass murders, the EU imposed personal sanctions against Yanukovych and his associates. And by the way, Austria, a country to which we went, was the first one to impose the sanctions. And when we arrived to Ukraine, uh, the presidential palace was revealed. Territory, a place where the president lived, was a very... It, it was impossible to believe that one person needs all that. It's like chandeliers for $70,000 each, half field, a tennis field, personal zoo, a laboratory to check everything the president eats before he eats. What else? Uh, of course, you need a personal gas station, you need a collection of cars. And to protect all that territory, you need a uh, five meters tall, uh, 54 kilometers, kilometers, 54 kilometers long fence. And guess who paid for all that? Of course, Ukrainian taxpayers, but through company in Ukraine, which was owned by Austrian and British companies. And all this corporate structure was set up by Western lawyer who also hided some uh, information in Liechtenstein Trust. So basically, behind corporate secrecy was hiding the president of a very corrupt and very robbed country. It was a simple example. Ukraine is uh, the country with the largest epidemics of HIV AIDS. In order to tackle these epidemics, you just need to provide pills and medications to those who are already infected. And the country has to procure these medications. How country procures that? Through competition. But how to win that competition in a very corrupt country? You just set up two companies, you hide that it's your companies. How to hide? Of course, through the corporate secrecy. You put a few layers of companies in Cyprus, Great Britain, and then at the end at Jersey on British Virgin Islands. And actually, uh, you imitate competition. It's you who are competing with yourself. And beforehand, of course, you go to the government official, to a politician, you negotiate a deal that you will win that 
contract and you win it. And then the price is twice or five times or even ten times higher for the medications which someone could procure in, through real competition. So what it causes to? It causes to that the budget is exhausted and less people are getting the pills. And if they are not getting the pills, they simply die. And it's not only with procurement for HIV AIDS. It's for procurement of medications for cancer, for tuberculosis, for hepatitis. It is for procurement for construction work. It's for procurement of everything, of transportation, of everything, uh, what you uh, actually use every day. And corporate secrecy is the easiest way to deprive a child with cancer from opportunity to survive. And the easiest way to make enormous car accidents uh, on the road which was constructed poorly just because uh, someone won the competition because he bribed but not proposed a good solution. And one important thing, why no one is noticing that? Why law enforcement are not noticing that in countries like Ukraine? It is important to understand that in very corrupt countries, in a developing world, law enforcement are captured. And it's just a matter for you, if you're a businessman, local businessman, to go and negotiate a deal. So you just pay them for not noticing that you are competing with yourself, and it's you hiding behind this corporate secrecy. I feel that I'm going too dramatic, so it's also some fun which we have when we are advocating for anti-money laundering and anti-corruption in Ukraine. These pictures uh, are from our direct actions in Ukraine uh, when we were demanding our government to end corporate secrecy. It was one of key demands following the revolution, one of key anti-corruption demands. So we asked our government to set up a public registry of beneficial ownership so that everyone could go to, to the web page uh, and to see who is that physical person really owning and controlling uh, any legal entity existing in Ukraine. And uh, with such kind of actions, we were motivating our MPs to vote for that law. They, of course, they didn't want to do that. The first picture, we were throwing rotten tomatoes to the pictures of those MPs who failed to vote uh, first time. And that art object which you see on the uh, right side, we promised every single MP who was not willing to vote for the law to uh, put their face on that art object, which we called corrupt object. It was kind of motivation. Of course, it's not only about that. It's also we paid too high price with uh, people uh, protested, martyred on the streets and with war. We paid a very high price to have this um, law um, done. Uh, so we have this law and we are now closely monitoring how it will be implemented. What about Europe? In Europe, creation of public register of beneficial ownership should be an issue of joint security. Uh, yes, there is a war in Europe, it was already told, uh, and it's on the territory of Ukraine, but it's not only Ukrainians who are losing their lives because of this war. Uh, the was a tragedy in summer, and the, the Malaysian aircraft was uh, shot uh, by Russian book missile. It was done by terrorists, backed up by Russia. And it's not a secret that uh, Russia supports and funds terrorists and uh, all the cruel events uh, happening because of someone pays for that. But if you look on, on, on Russia and on uh, where Russia generates funding, it's mostly from oil and gas, and the largest oil and gas producer is Gazprom, uh, the national company. But look, Gazprom has affiliated entities all across Europe, all across the globe. In every, almost every single country in Europe, there are affiliated entities with Gazprom. And there are strange people behind these entities, but we don't have opportunity to see who are these real physical people. Um, another example, Gunvar, 
the one of the largest European oil crude trader, the one of the owners of Gunvo, Timchenko, was sanctioned by the U.S. last year, but he managed to sell his part of this oil crude producer to his partner. In one day before sanctions, he managed to sell his stake. But look at the Gunvor. This is actually the corporate structure. You never see a person there. So who owns what? Because of such a complex structure, he was able to avoid sanctions of one of the uh, powerful jurisdictions in the world. Another issue, propaganda. Russian propaganda is one of the uh, challenges uh, for Europe now. But the solution is simple. If we have a public register of beneficial ownership, we would know who owns our media and who owns our communication companies. A simple solution, transparency to ownership of corporate and legal entities. Why Europe is not ready for this um, solution. Well, actually, there is some progress. In December last year, there was, uh, there was a deal reached on the level of the European Parliament, and now countries, member states, are obliged to set up the registries of beneficial owners, but they will be hidden. They could be open, and it depends on the member states whether in a year or two they decide to make them open so that every one of you could see who really owns companies. So, Right now is that moment when we can ask, we can stand up and ask our governments to make this public register of beneficial owners. It's right now the moment to join the personal cause of Charmin Kuch, executive director of Global Witness. She is a TED Prize winner of 2014. And because of her work and work of her organization, Great Britain is going forward and setting up public registry of beneficial owners. And you could do the same in your country. Just try to do some research, educate yourself, try to find out who owns the largest companies in your country, the largest communication companies, energy companies, financial institutions, who are physical persons, individuals, not companies, but individuals controlling them. Try to find out who are that NGOs, organizations within your country who are driving for the change, who are driving for uh, public register of beneficial owners. Support them, join them. Write a letter to your member of parliament and to your government and ask them that you want to have this public registry of beneficial owners of companies in your country. It's a moment for us to stand up all together and to say, that I don't want to have dirty money. I don't want dirty money to penetrate my government, to penetrate financial system of my government. I don't want dirty money to go into my pocket and influence my life. Thank you.